All right, everybody, welcome to another Perceptive Podcast here on the Game Wisdom channel. Of course, I am still Josh Placer, and my guest tonight, he is returning guest. He's worked on tabletop games. We've talked about uh, Q&A and all manner of other topics in the past, and we've got more to discuss tonight, including his Kickstarter game lockup, as well as what it's like to be a freelancer. So please welcome back to the stream, John Brieger. Hi everybody! It's uh, it's great to be back on. We have got a bunch of exciting <laughs> stuff to talk about today. Um, I guess I don't know what you wanted to start with. Uh, a little bit about me: I work in the tabletop de uh, game design industry, uh, both as a designer, uh, making my own games and licensing them to publishers, and in a role that we call the developer, which is a mm -hmm. very different role in the board game industry than it is in the video game industry. And as a developer, I work with small publishers to refine their prototype games and turn them into marketable products. And so that involves things like running playtesting programs, user research, and also a lot of things like mathematical modeling and balancing and all the final tweaks that turn a prototype game into a final product. Mm -hmm. And when we last had you on, uh, we discussed more about, I believe that was when we were doing the thing about licensing and yeah. discuss some of the challenges thereof. And for tonight's cast, we got kind of like a, a potluck kind of discussion, discussing what's been going on with you, uh, some of your projects, and so on and so forth. So I figured to get going, uh, we were just talking about this before, about you going into a freelance role. So I guess for the people watching or listening to us live or recorded, what is kind of like your freelance job now? Yeah, uh, so I've been obviously working on, on games for a while now, and I finally had enough games work coming in that I felt comfortable making that my, my full-time design practice. And we, we talked a little bit previously about I was working designing retail experiences and how there's lots of, lots of parallels between designing retail stores and designing games and the types of skills you use. Mm -hmm. But now I'm, I am making board games full-time, and I primarily do freelance development work. So a, a publisher will hire me either on a flat rate or hourly to help them with a game that is maybe almost done but not quite finished. Uh, and I come on towards the end of the project. A, a typical engagement for me is probably around uh, two to six months of work and will, depending on the scope of the project, I might be revising a lot of things. I might just be doing balancing and tweaks and running their playtesting program. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it can, it can vary a lot depending on both the nature of the game itself and, the, and the, the timeline and the project. But a lot of it has to do with understanding consumers, understanding the players, and figuring out what they want out of uh, out of the game and how to not just remove some of the, the rough edges, but also amp up the fun, right? Any way that we can find the core engaging loop of the game and make that even better for the players, that's that's a big role in development. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and, oh, we got a question on the... Yep, and I just want to clarify, with your freelancing, are you doing in the tabletop industry, video game, or a combination of the two? Uh, currently, I am focused on the tabletop game industry. I kind of build myself as a specialist in interactive physical experiences. Mm -hmm. So I definitely have worked in the past in the digital space. I'm looking probably for new clients. If it was a digital project, looking for things like installations, arcade games, that kind of thing that has a, an interactive physical element to it as well. Okay. Uh, I think I'm probably going to do an escape room sometime next year as well, if you're familiar with nice. that kind of immersive interactive entertainment. <laughs> Great. I know, like, for myself, I try to do more in terms of consulting and freelance work like, for, like, game developers. Yeah. But it seemed like kind of a very uh, tough nut to crack, I think, for trying to explain yeah. to someone, like... And I guess uh, we'll get to Dragon's question in a second, but I won't ask this for you, John. Like, it seems like, especially when it comes to design, it's such a personal kind of development, especially for independent developers, that it seems like it's kind of hard to, like, come in and say, you know, I think you should do this, this, and this, 
and you know take your idea and go in this completely different direction yeah and i think it's it's very much about building and establishing relationships and trust with your clients you because depending on where they are in the process and how involved they are you know this is their project it is their mm-hmm. product and their game and probably something that they're pretty passionate about making it the best and the the what you've gotten there are reasons for all the decisions that have been made uh, so far and so typically when I I start my consulting I begin by taking a really nice long look at the game and at the product and be watching it be played so that I don't off the cuff start suggesting things uh, without a lot of strong reasoning behind them you know that said I think part of the reason that people will engage with me is they are hiring a consultant for their expertise right so uh, ideally there's some trust there where they can say okay if he says that this isn't going to play well on the market mm-hmm. you know I trust his opinion because I think he's an expert or has at least some amount of expertise in the field uh, but that can definitely be be hard especially when you have you know the the relationship is more than just me and the publisher you have the myself as the consultant and then the publisher and they've licensed that game design from an original designer and so the designer has trusted the publisher to take good care of their baby and now the mm-hmm. publisher's brought me in to make some tweaks and so mm-hmm. i also try even at the outset of projects where my client is the publisher and not the designer of the game I try to loop the designer in, I have a call where the publisher isn't on the call at all, where it's just me and the designer, and I talk about what's important to them in the process, what their vision was, get a little sense of the history behind the development of the game to date. And that way, that's that's one more step where I'm I'm building trust and, and showing the designer that I respect them and that I respect their vision. Yeah. And I think what you said a few minutes ago, John, is very important that you're not coming in to say that this is your project now, that you are taking over the reins. You're there to make this the best possible version of their project. Yes, e- exactly. That's that's a great way to put it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know, like I said, when it comes to the game design or video game design side of things, like I've looked at game developers. I try to do some more freelancing on my end, but it just didn't seem to take. But... It can be very hard for people. I think this could probably be its own topic in of itself about being hard to accept that level of criticism and critique, especially from someone from the outside looking in. Yeah, and and I think that's uh, that's a big, big factor in the way that I engage with my clients and the types of consulting I do. I do a lot of running playtesting programs, and so when I provide feedback on tweaks to the game design and tweaks to the balancing, I'm typically also, that's associated with a set of mathematical modeling or a set of feedback that's coming from real players that I've interpreted and analyzed. Uh, And it's one thing to argue with me saying like, ah, I don't like your opinion on this thing. Mm -hmm. It's another thing when I'm like, here's some quotes from real people who have played your game and said, I didn't enjoy this or this made me feel frustrated when X. And I think that's part of the value of playtesting and of running, you know, very structured games user research. Mm -hmm. Uh, Everyone making your games, playtest them. Playtest them lots. (laughs) Yeah, that could... We just need to have that, like, at the start of every one of these cats, I think. (laughs) But uh, we did have a question from a few minutes ago. Draken asks, is it more common to get a flat rate or get an hourly rate when it comes to freelancing? It, it depends on the nature of the job. Uh, for consulting work, where I am mostly providing uh, opinions and advice, it's more typical to get hourly. Mm-hmm. Uh, for games where I'm taking on a significant uh, role, like I'm running their playtesting program or similar, mm-hmm. uh, I've leaned more now towards doing flat rates. Uh, typically, I'll get some percentage of that up front, either between 25 and 50% of the flat rate up front. And then the remainder of it milestone as we make progress on the project. Sometimes that also might include a small percentage of initial crowdfunding or initial offering sales, but not a continuing royalty on every copy sold. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the reason I've, I've switched to do that is actually less about 
making uh, about you know how much money I make or any individual factor. It's about time and invoicing. So I'm not I don't have to track hours because I'm working you know mostly remote from the client. Uh, mm-hmm. So it, when I take an hourly job, that means I now have to track all my hours. And then I have to invoice usually bi-weekly. Whereas when we have milestones, the invoices are very simple, it's very clear. And I think anyone who's worked freelance knows getting clients to pay you and pay you on time mm-hmm. is work, even when you work with great clients and uh, they're people you trust and you have good relationships with them. Uh, it's just hard because, especially for me, I work primarily for very small businesses. These are, you know, two two to five people in most cases. And I need to make it as easy as possible for them to pay me mm-hmm. uh, and as little work for me to get paid. And so a milestone flat rate payment is a lower number of invoices over a long project. And it's more clear, uh, you know, when things when payment should be distributed. Uh, So I do work hourly sometimes on long projects and the the reason I would take a project like that hourly is typically if the client or myself doesn't really know the scope of work that I'm gonna be getting into. And so it's really hard for me to estimate a flat rate Mm -hmm. because if I, I could just wildly underestimate and then end up on the hook for doing, you know, like 300 hours of work when I estimated for 120. Mm-hmm. And so that's the that's a situation where I'm more likely to be working hourly on a long project. Mm-hmm. Now here's a question for you, John. This is something that I struggled with. And that was coming up with your actual rate. Because, I mean, again, there are probably seminars and books and all that designed around this. But, like, and obviously I'm not going to ask you to name your actual rate, but... Like, how did you sit down, come up with just like how much you want to charge people for your time? Yeah. Um, so you know, I'll, I'll I'll give some some ranges. Uh, you know, I I also I don't want to necessarily discuss my actual rate because it it changes. Yeah. So my rate to consult on a small little family game uh, per hour might be very different than my rate to consult on a a miniatures game where the price point's going to be you know ninety dollars a box like. Yeah. Part of it's about how much value I'm going to be delivering as Mm -hmm. part of my services. Um, And similarly, for running playtests, my work to run playtests of short family games is lower because it's easier for me to attract and find players, and I can get repeat players Mm -hmm. a lot quicker. Um, So coming up up with my rate, to get back to the question, uh, part of it was there was a, a minimum threshold where I'm like, okay, assuming that I'm going to work you know, 40 to 50 hours a week. Uh, and I'm going to take lots of time off because part of the benefit of me switching to be a freelancer is I wanted a more flexible schedule so I could spend more time with my family. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if I'm going to have, you know, take lots of time off, but work 40 to 50 hours a week, about how much do I need to be making per hour to cover all my bills and my expenses? Uh, then add in the fact that now that I'm freelance, I need to be buying my own health insurance and through getting it through my company, oh, yes. um, mm-hmm. which is, uh, yeah. and <laughs> I have a, tr- a very, very high customer acquisition cost, right? To get each client, I'm doing a lot of work that's unpaid time in terms of meeting with them. Uh, I travel to a lot of trade shows and conventions. That's the main way that I book new work is in-person meetings at trade shows. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, and and part of that trade show is I have other business that's happening there too, right? I have uh, play testing sessions. So I'm going to pitches of my own projects, uh, but just to you know, just for viewer benefit, I have an estimate. My travel budget for next year for business travel is going to be about 15k. So mm. that's a huge amount yes. of cost that I'm not necessarily getting paid hourly or working as part of that time. That's just straight cost to me out of my business. Oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, so my hourly rate kind of takes a little bit of that into account. And then I also know roughly what other people charge in the board game space, right? So video games in general, consulting pays a little bit better. Uh, so, you know, it's 
I think a, a typical consulting rate in the video game industry is going to be between 50 and 75 an hour uh, from from talking with a couple other people. Uh, and board games pays a little worse than that. Uh, the, the money is lower. And then I also know what my hourly rate is as a designer in the field where I have the most expertise, which is uh, retail experience design. So I can say, if you want to hire me right now to help you design your retail store, it costs you 75 an hour. Mm -hmm. um, as a as a freelance consultant and I am you know I have a lot of expertise in the game field but I you know I've only been working in this field about two years now and I have there are some translatable skills from retail design but not a hundred percent so I can't charge quite as much as I can there uh, so you know for a typical client my my rate has actually been as low as about 35 an hour to as high as about 60 an hour, hmm. uh, depending on the project. Yeah, and I think that's one of the more interesting things, especially I think what I try to do with freelance, I think what a lot of people also don't assume, is that you do have to be flexible with your prices. You can't just say, I am going to be $8 an hour, and if you give me you know, $76, I will say screw you kind of thing. You have to be, able, you have to be malleable there. Yeah, um, and and that's and I think that's one of the reasons that the the flat rate also uh, helps a little bit is it helps hide a little bit of the math and obviously I am doing an estimate of how many hours it's going to take and mm -hmm. and looking at what my hourly rate approximately is going to be, but also there's a there's a lot of other things that are are going into that. Uh, you know, I might charge sixteen hour if someone wanted to hire me for two three hour consulting sessions. Uh, but if that same client for the exact same project wanted to pay me for you know 50 or 100 hours worth of work, I might not charge that rate. I might charge something lower mm -hmm. uh, because you know I'm going to get more total billable hours out of it. And that fixed cost, all that time I've spent setting up the job, meeting the client, gaining their trust enough for them to hire me, that's the same whether I'm billing six hours or 100 hours. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, it sounds like what I've been doing in my presentations around here. We're trying to figure out just exactly what to price at, but still be open. Like I'm not going to say to someone, or I'm not going to let them uh, take off like two hundred dollars off my price. But you know, I still have like that wiggle room uh, when I'm putting things together. Is that I know that even at the bare minimum, I know I'm still in the black at the end of it. Yeah, uh, and we will see. You know, I think. Part of it, I'm also looking right now for projects that I think are going to make good portfolio pieces oh, for yeah. my business, uh, because as I grow my client list, and you know, and I'm sure same as for you, mm -hmm. that helps prove the value of the work that I've been doing. Oh, yes. And I think my average rate, probably eight months from now, will be a bit higher, or I would hope it'll be higher once I have, you know, I think I have four or five games releasing in the next eight months that I've worked on. So. Yeah. And that's what this definitely is all about, especially as a freelancer, is building your portfolio up, making sure people know your name. I mean, hell, I, I'm definitely with you right there, John, with Game Wisdom, the YouTube channel, and all that stuff. Like, when people search for Josh Blaster, they know exactly what they're seeing on the internet right there. Yeah, uh, and and that and that's the thing, is so you, you're also looking at long-term long -term benefit and uh, you know, projects with a with a bigger company or a bigger studio or a inter You know, we were talking about licensed games, interesting mm -hmm. IPs. Uh, you know, especially when, like, I'm. You know, I don't know exactly who your ideal client is, but I work primarily with really tiny, tiny mm -hmm. publishers. And so sometimes I'll be like, "Yeah, I worked with this person," and they'll be like, "Who's that?" Right? Uh, because you know, on average, people aren't going to know who a lot of these names are on just by name. But if you're like, ah, yes, I worked on insert name of action movie, the game, people at least know that that yeah. big intellectual property. And so that's that's another another factor for me is uh, am I going to get to work with a or maybe, you know, I just like I really wanted to work on uh, a specific. Uh, oh, I can't talk about this one yet. <laughs> I have a, I'm working on a. Uh, we can say it's a, a best-selling fantasy novel series, uh, <laughs> and it's uh, it's a really really cool fantasy series. I am a fan. You know, I'm not 
may, maybe like a, a mega fan, but you know, I've read all the books a couple times and it's, so I was just like, yes, like absolutely. I want to work on this game because I'm a fan and that's a really cool opportunity for me to work on a, an IP that I'm really passionate about. <laughs> We'll see the audience or the live record can guess that by the end of our little broadcast here. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can, I, you know, I can uh, put a little, one of the things I'm doing for all my projects in, in 2018, 2019 is I have a, a list of cryptic clues. So each project gets a, a mysterious clue uh, <laughs> for what it is. And some people have already figured some of them out. <laughs> and then when, once the project gets announced, I'm like, ah, this was this. Uh, so, you know, uh, the project I have on Kickstarter right now, Lock Up, was, called, was originally called uh, Truest, uh, Truer Dungeon. Uh, it's the only fantasy dungeon game that I have played where the dungeon is being used as an actual prison. <laughs> um, you are crews of fantasy monsters committing crimes and avoiding the suspicion of the guards. <laughs> All right. I guess um, before we move on to another topic, John, is there anything else regarding freelancing that you'd like to bring up before we switch gears? Um, anything else for solving freelancing? Um, I think you know the last thing I would I would say is I was freelancing before I quit my day job and started freelancing full time, and I think that's. If you are someone watching this and you're considering freelancing the industry, you know, get permission from your employer to get another job if, if that's something that you, you need from your employer. And just try it part time, right? It, you know, it's you don't want to quit your job and then try to build your freelance practice from scratch with no clients because it is really slow to build your name and get your name out there and book the work that you need to be booking in order to really support yourself. And that's a that's a big big hurdle. And so, you know, it. While I've only been doing this as my my full time job job for about six weeks now, I've been essentially just working two jobs for about a year. Uh, you know, I was working seven days a week. Uh, you know, thirty or forty hours on game stuff, and then forty or fifty on retail stuff. So that that can sometimes be what it takes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And again, this could probably be its own podcast in and of itself we could come back to in the future. <laughs> yeah. I guess uh, before we'll spend some time talking about your projects, I think we'll say that for kind of like the back half of the cast. But in terms of actual like game design or tabletop design topics, is there anything that's interesting you right now that you'd like to discuss for the next few minutes? Um, so one of the things, if we wanted to talk about... Uh, Balancing is a is a topic that I've been working on a lot recently, uh, because as a developer, it's become an increasing part of my job. Mm -hmm. And what I often say to uh, designers when they're starting out is like, you know, don't worry about the balance of your game at the start. Right, you're just trying to make your game fun. Mm -hmm. You can balance it at the end. But now I'm having more and more of these <laughs> projects where you know I am the end, and it's time. It's time to balance the game. Uh, so, uh, I've been doing a lot of mathematical modeling, uh, so kind of balancing through statistics and modeling of gameplay without looking at actual plays, but a mathematical model only takes you so far, and so it's important to use your model as a guideline and then take it in and, and test it rigorously with real players. Um, for video games, one of the things that's nice is you can do things like a, you know, like a Steam uh, alpha release that you actually are are essentially having a pretty wide playtest net uh, mm -hmm. relative to what you might get if you were just running a private playtesting program and recruiting testers. Uh, though that takes it does take marketing work for sure. Uh, for board games, running that like a really really wide playtest net is very difficult. So, you know, a large playtester set is in the in the hundreds, not in the thousands, whereas, you know, for for video games a large playtest set is typically in the thousands. Uh in terms of number of unique players. Mm -hmm. um, so, you you know, what I always tell people is your game will probably be played by more your board game 
will be probably played by more people in the first week it's released than it will be than it will have been played ever during all of your playtesting combined, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, if your goal is to be able to like just try kind of trial and error through playtesting, that's not going to cut it. You need to be doing math on top of your playtesting, and so neither one is a hundred percent foolproof method, but. You know, if you just try trial and error, the chances that something slips through on your trial and error is just, it's its guaranteed to happen. Um, and I, you know, and we see games on the video game side where you have, you can have a lot more playtesting and you, the teams are much bigger. Balance issues happen all the time because it's, balancing is so, so difficult. Uh, you know, I think sometimes when we as players, once someone's identified something mm -hmm. that's an overpowered strategy, it's really easy for us to then replicate it. But identifying that strategy can be incredibly, incredibly difficult in playtesting. And so, you know, uh, feel 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 bad for devs. You know, when <laughs> when we look at overpowered strategies, <laughs> we feel bad, right? Um, and for video games, you can you can look at how the strategy plays out, and you do a little bit more playtesting. Is it really overpowered, or have people just not figured out how to counter it yet? Right, that's that's an important one too. Uh, sometimes people are a little too quick to cry. It's OP, right? Oh, and yes, the solution is actually good counterplay, not a not a nerf. Um, but uh, for video games, you can release a patch most of the time. Board games, patching a board game is very <laughs> expensive yes. and very difficult. Uh, so, you know, obviously, for if you're printing multiple printings of your board game, uh, your updated printings can have fixes. You can release new additions. You can sell, you know, if you have cards that need to be patched, right? You could sell some cards through your website, like here's the cards with the errata. But players don't really like that too much. And chances are pretty good that the majority of people who have copies of your game aren't going to receive that that patch or that fix. So you really have to pay a lot of attention uh, to if you know if there's an exploitable flaw in your game and people find it, that can be a, a death sentence for your game uh, in the board game space because the cost of issuing a patch or a fix can be prohibitive. Oh yeah. And a lot of really good points there, John, that I want to touch on, especially about balance. And I guess the first thing that I want to bring up, and this is one thing that I think is another one of those misconceptions between consumer and developers, is that there is such a thing as a game that is 100% balanced, that everything yes. is perfect <laughs> and, you know, this game is just, you know, the light shining down on the heavens, there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, um, 100% agree. No such thing as a perfectly balanced game. Uh, you know, if and I and honestly, you probably there's games that if they were perfectly balanced wouldn't be as fun. Mm -hmm. yep. um, like you're smoothed out all the edges and you just have a featureless round <laughs> ball. <laughs> yeah, and especially. When it comes, again, when it comes to balancing, we can talk about things from a single player versus an AI standpoint or player versus player because they're both two fundamentally different things. And I guess, again, like this, each one of these topics we're bringing up, John, this could be its own podcast. That's how deep we can get oh, yeah. into. But I guess, I guess at a high level standpoint, like from what you've done and some of the playtesting work you've seen, what are some like the major differences when you're thinking about balance from a player versus player perspective and a player versus AI or player versus kind of like the dungeon master kind of perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So from a player versus player perspective, uh, often what I'm looking at is opportunity to win. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, if there's a strategy that the first player who takes it is always going to win. That's indicative of a, of a problem. Yeah. Now, sometimes there's a strategy that is better than the other strategies, but if multiple people all conglomerate on it, it becomes worse, right? You're, let's say, you know, 
we're going to invent some abstract, you know, wood, wood is the best strategy, right? Mm -hmm. Wood is clearly more valuable than sheep. Mm -hmm. But if everyone goes wood, the wood is divided up between a bunch of players and then it's no longer the, the best. Uh, and so that's the kind of thing that you get in a multiplayer game where you have competition to achieve a strategy that might be worth something. Mm -hmm. So how to tell when is wood actually just too powerful relative to sheep and when is it uh, just, oh, if players compete for wood, it won't be an issue, depends on kind of the avenues of interaction between players in your game. Uh, are the avenues of interaction uh, strictly uh, zero sum, right? So if I take it, you can't have it. Are they, are they splits? Uh, so if we both take it, we each get half. Uh, do they rely on momentum or positioning, right? As I advance across the map, I'm more likely to be able to hold the choke points. Uh, so, and when you have things that rely on momentum, that's where you can get into a lot of balance trouble. Yeah. Uh, because if players who start winning continue to win, even if at the very beginning of the game you had a chance to stop them, mm -hmm. it feels a lot more unfair because you they haven't won the game yet, but they're just snowballing their way to victory. And so there are lots of games that have different approaches to snowballs, right? Some have catch-up mechanics. Uh, as I'm behind, I get something to help put me back in the race, the classic kind of rubber band from a from a racing game or the blue shell uh, in Mario Kart. Uh, some games have very obvious and intentional snowballs, right? Uh, League of Legends, I think, is a good example of this, where their decision was there's a point at which you're, you snowball and the game is just going to end so quickly that it's fine if someone snowballs to victory as long as the game doesn't drag oh, out God. forever. Yeah, you don't want to be waiting like two hours for victory when you know that it's already done. Right. And going back and like continuing with this point about snowballing and again about the ease of strategies, this is a major part I know for a lot of CCG and TCG based games, which uh, we had Brian Cronin on or uh, John uh, Traverius who worked on uh, Duelist. This could be like we could have a whole little discussion here, but that's always been a major point about those kinds of games because as we've seen, if you can start, like, as you said, like, when it comes to these dominant strategies, and no, it's not just, you know, I have five cards and I win immediately. It's I start playing this card, you can't do anything about it, so I play another card that you can't do anything about. And then, and I had the same exact situation when I played or tried to play Hearthstone, where it was like, I don't even need to sit here and play the game. He's already won. I'm just, you know going through the motions for the next 20 turns or however long it takes for him to finish his grand plan. Yeah. And and that's a that's so so important when you look at, at games that have momentum is it's a, and it's a design decision, right? Uh you know, you can make a game that is is balanced that has snowballing mechanics. You just need to decide how you want players to feel at different points during the game and is there good avenues of interaction for them, right? If there's a combo that takes, or or a lock, let's say, uh, if, for people who are not familiar with the concept of a lock in a, in a strategy game, uh, it's the idea that uh, once I've begun uh, this sequence of strategy, you are locked down. And no matter what decisions you make, your decisions have stopped mattering. I've locked you out of playing the game, and now it's just me searching for my win condition. Uh, so, uh, and that's that's a, a term that can happen. It can happen a lot in uh, like real time strategy games oh, or uh, yes. TCGs uh, or CCGs where uh, your your strategy has just crippled your opponent and you can't win the game. But they have no chance of of uh, they have no chance of coming back. It's just you now. You're just searching or biding your time for a way to decisively end the game. Yeah, and. Um, um, uh, an example that I saw from Hearthstone, which I think a lot of the early players know about, was the quote-unquote Miracle Rogue decks that was prevalent during, I think, I want to say it was either the end of the beta or during like the first few months of launch, where a player, a rogue players would make use of the Gadgetran Auctioneer, who would let them keep drawing cards. And it basically got to that point of, again, as you just said, John, that 
I just keep drawing my cards. I'm just basically keeping my turn going for as long as I can. So I basically draw all the cards I will ever need. And then it's like, what, what's the opponent supposed to do? But, and this is actually a really good segue into talking more about those trying to spot overpowered builds. Because there are people who say, oh, it's fine. You know, as long as you do X, you can beat that. But again, it's a situation of if 80% of the time, every time someone does this exact strategy, they win, how is someone supposed to compete against it? Yeah. And and that's the thing is there's some there's the line, right, between you want to have interesting, mm -hmm. uh, in, especially in a, in a TCG, CCG, you want to have interesting synergies and combos for players to discover. Uh, that's an important part of the fun of playing a game like that. Oh, yes. But you also need to make sure that it doesn't come down to do I draw my combo before you race me out, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that there is a, a healthy metagame where once someone's found the combo, uh, the the whole metagame has mm -hmm. been has been solved. Uh, and that and the same thing is true for uh, turn-based strategy games or even. Uh, non-turn-based strategy games in the digital space where, you know, once someone's found the best build in StarCraft, uh, that there's no reason to play that same faction and not play that build. Yeah. Uh, there's no counterplay. It's just a question of how fast can you execute this preset strategy. Mm -hmm. And and that's something where you need to be, as a as a developer and as a, as a designer, as someone who's involved in the making of games, watching for the avenues of interaction. And I think that's that's where it comes down to a lot, is how does my opponent interact with this strategy? Is that interaction just a race? They need to finish the game before my slow strategy pays out. Can they interact with elements of that combo or synergy to reduce my chances of being able to assemble it all? And to me, ideally, you want to try to solve those types of balance issues through interaction rather than by stripping them out of the game because it's oh, fun yeah. to you're like ha I, I i assembled the contraption like how cool is it that i built this thing out of all these parts and now i have mm -hmm. my doomsday device that <laughs> wins the game but at the same time you need it to feel interactive and and interesting for the player who's across the table watching you assemble all your pieces mm -hmm. um and I think another big point, I think you may have brought this up a few minutes ago, is just how easy is it to achieve this task? Like, is this overpower build going to be something that requires a lot of min-max, saying a lot of advanced play? Or it's just literally, I draw five cards or I build three units, I'm now unstoppable, you know, screw the opponent kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I think board games... Uh, that I, I like about board games is uh, they typically have very clearly defined avenues of interaction. And so when things aren't working uh, on those lines in terms of how, how difficult combos are to assemble and, and similar, it's easy for you to figure out where to tweak the interaction to make the, to either make the combo better or make the combo worse. Uh, whereas video games that have lots and lots of potential avenues of interaction uh, can be a lot more difficult because you don't have as as rigidly defined channels so you're in some ways the constraints of the design space uh, help you I think in a, in a board game setting or in a, a digital implementation of a board game like a like hearthstone mm -hmm. yeah and uh, I'm kind of the same way dragon I've tried on and off to play hearthstone and just never hooked me and as a quick tangent i'm right now waiting for gwent to do its big redesign and then yep. jump back in and see just what the hell is going on there with what they've done but yeah it's very tricky when it comes to that kind of balance i mean you brought up league of legends earlier and that's another really good point again about you have all these different champions i don't even know how many champions are in that game right now but, I yeah I, I lost count uh, somewhere you know in the high 80s and yeah. we're well over 100 now. <laughs> yeah, so I mean um, when we get to that level, and this is one of the biggest things about balance. I think this is a really good differentiator between a single player and multiplayer balance. In a single player game, everything is pretty much 
it. Like, I know that this is an 8 to 10 hour RPG or a uh, 80 hour game. I know all the elements in there. Oh my god, 137. Oh my <laughs> god. But when you're playing a multiplayer game, when you are constantly seeing things change, and this is actually a really good question for you, John, again, about uh, that kind of meta game. You brought up the term earlier, and it's a major part of game balance. And for yeah. people watching us right now, don't know what we're talking about. The meta game is kind of the quote unquote state of the game in terms of what's popular, what's trending, what's the best strategies, what's the worst strategies. And it can be the death nail for any competitive game if the meta becomes solidified. As in, I, as you said earlier, earlier like, I know that X is the best champion, or this is the best deck. So why the hell should I play Y if X is always the best thing? So it's always been this never-ending, and this is again what we were talking about earlier, this never-ending quest for balance, or I guess imbalance in a sense, to try and keep the meta from stabilizing. Right. And, and this is where um, digital games have, some, again, some advantages over tabletop games, is when your meta looks like it's crystallizing, you introduce new content mm -hmm. into that meta, right? Uh, so that's one way of solving a meta that's that's gotten out of balance is you instead of nerfing something you just introduce new cards that mm -hmm. have avenues of interaction with that uh, so you see that in, in games like Hearthstone or League of Legends right you're introducing new champions you're introducing new uh, new cards new sets obviously I think the 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 biggest model for this is when you look at uh, the the granddaddy of all TCGs Magic the Gathering right which has been continuously introducing new cards since 1992. <laughs> uh, and they're, they're, I would say, probably experts at this uh, more than anyone else uh, of the idea of keeping a, a rotating meta uh, and the idea of, of actually formatting. So it grew, their card pool grew to a point. They had so much content in the game where the introduction of a new, you know, 130 or 200 card magic set didn't change the available pool of cards enough. So they came up with the idea of rotation. And this is that the oldest cards that have been released, you know, we have, uh, you know, blocks of cards here. When we add new cards to the end, we push cards off the old. Uh, and this means that we're doing two things. We are keeping our pool of available content for players to select their decks from or select their, build their strategies from constant. Um, and we're removing cards that might have been key elements in previous strategies. So we're introducing new potential strategies and changing the available current strategies. Um, and that's, <laughs> that's gonna become a really important thing for, you know, Hearthstone now also has formats and I would not be surprised to find other games like League of Legends eventually also introducing tiered formats where, you know, this season in competitive, only these 80 champions of the, you know, let's mm -hmm. say League is at the point where they have 500 champions, only these 80 of the 500 are available in competitive this season. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I would not be surprised to see more competitive games, uh, especially in the the kind of what we call lifestyle games where people who play these games that's their their primary game that they play introducing formats along those lines yeah and it would definitely solve a lot of issues especially in terms of trying to keep that balance together because as we said it's not only never ending it's not possible and you had a really good example again it's just like smoothing out all the corners and you just had this very uh a spherical, wow, my mouth is dying, spherical uh, <laughs> thing that just doesn't really do anything. Now, I think with that said, I have two uh, questions for you regarding that, or the two topics. So the first thing, as you said, John, these games can become lifestyles. Again, somebody who gets high into League of Legends or Hearthstone or even something like CSGO, that is it for them. They're going to collect everything, they're going to have all the stuff, and becomes a very interesting play when you are removing or shaking things up. As we said earlier, you don't really want to say, this strategy has been forever banned, or I am removing this unit from the game. 
Because what happens, and this is probably its own topic again for, <laughs> again, drinking game every time we say that today, but what happens when you're dealing with stuff that people pay for? Again, with something like League of Legends, with Hearthstone, or even with like the free-to-play mobile space, people are spending big money for booster packs, for acquiring these cards or these units. So what happens when you figure out that this thing that people have just spent four or $500 on, you need to change? Yeah, and that's, and that's a, a really, really tough problem to crack. Yeah. Uh, and it's one that you know, Magic the Gathering has been dealing with Still, and they, uh, their solution was you have f multiple formats, right? Some where mm -hmm. everything is legal, including all those cards that people have already invested in, and you know a, a format that's only their rotating set, right? And that's the format mm -hmm. that's gonna have the most, uh, you know. So the uh, let's what just to use I don't want to use Magic as an example too much, but they mm -hmm. have what they call vintage, where almost everything is legal. Um, and the way that they change, uh, they keep the meta in vintage uh, from crystallizing is they'll ban cards, which mm -hmm. means they're outright banned, and they'll restrict cards, which means the card is limited to just one copy in a deck. Um, and so they'll, they primarily, the vintage meta changes through the addition of, or the banning and unbanning of cards. Uh, mm -hmm. And cards that are banned often go on the ban <laughs> list, the meta changes, and then they unban them again. Yeah. Um, then you have standard, which is the all the way newest format. There's some in between, where it where the meta primarily changes from the addition of new content and the pushing of old content out of the format. Um, and so the key was that after they came up with the idea of this rotating format, uh, you they had to come up with a, essentially a second format mm -hmm. to hold value for the cards that are getting pushed out. Uh, and it's definitely not perfect, but that's that is a solution. Uh, so you need some, you know, let's say let's take League of Legends as an example. League of Legends wanted to introduce a format where only the most, you know, the uh, the sixty most recently released champions are legal and competitive. Um, you know, they need to come up with a engaging, competitive way to play League of Legends, right? It can't just be, this is, you can play them in free play practice mode. It has to be yeah. something that pe players are gonna derive real joy from mm -hmm. to play with all of the champions or the older champions. Um, and eventually as they release enough content, they might need more than one way to play with everything. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, it's it's hard because, I'll, and especially in a, in a game like League, you, your character is very much an avatar of you, and mm -hmm. so you're invested. You know, people have like mains, right? That's their, oh, God, they're yes. like <laughs> an expert in playing one thing, right? And they might play a couple other things, but you know, they they have a lot of very personal investment in this character, in this this deck or this archetype or this strategy. And when you take that away from them, you need to reassure your player base that. Uh, that their investment still has value. That their uh, uh, that their character or their their avatar within the game still is important to the company, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that they, as an extension as a player, are important to the company. And so that's I mean, you can see that even when you look at balance changes, you know, people who are mains of a character that was then you know nerfed by the company, they mm -hmm. will. You know, they're like, oh no, I can't believe, like, you know, I spent hundreds <laughs> of hours practicing playing this character. Um, you know, I can't believe that now they're not viable and competitive. And so I think part of that is you need to have, you know, I think you need to provide multiple avenues for people to play the characters that they've invested in. Yeah, and um, to add on to that point, we also discuss again at the competitive level, there is big money involved. When someone becomes, you know, again, my experience at League of Legends, I'll, I'll go with fighting games, for instance. Like, yeah. fighting games someone, is a, a good example, too. Like, if I become the greatest Guile player in Street Fighter, and you just, and Capcom decides one day, we're just going to nerf the hell out Guile, 
you know, what happened to all those hours I spent playing it? More importantly, what happens to my professional career? If, as you just said, John, that these people or these characters, they become part of your own persona. Somebody who is, you know, the number one uh, shaman deck player in Hearthstone probably isn't going to switch to a warrior deck or to a mage deck. They may have those as backups, but if you are primarily known for X and X gets destroyed, like, that can drive you out of the game. Because as you said, there also has to be that layer of trust. Like, I need to know that you're not going to, if I decide to switch to Warrior, then, you know, in a month from now, you decide, oh, we're just going to nerf Warriors now. Then it's like, oh, great, I just got screwed again. <laughs> you know, when will I learn? Yeah. And, and and that's the thing is I think, uh, you you know, you mentioned fighting games is another great example where, mm -hmm. you know, you control a single character and there are fighting game players that really do, you know, on the tournament scene specialize in playing, you know, one, oh, maybe yeah. two characters versus I think uh, League of Legends, most of the professional players play a higher number of characters than that because they have a more complicated banning and role oh, system. Yes. Um, but, you know, you know, I have some friends who are, who are top tier fighting game players and they play two characters, right? And so when you talk about these kind of formatting rotations, it's very different in a, in a fighting game where the expectation is actually the, I think fighting games tend to actually have a, a more solidified meta over time, right? Mm -hmm. You get, you end up with these tiers of characters and then Typically, game companies don't issue big patches or big content updates. They just release a, a brand new game, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's that's more the model that those those games have gone with. Um, versus, instead of adding a new character every three months to Smash, they just mm -hmm. make a new Smash, right? Yeah. And um, Dragon has a really good point about uh, Dragon Ball Fighter Z because we've been seeing this kind of in like I guess this current wave of fighting games where they aren't going for multiple releases. They are going for these patches and these new characters. Um, Street Fighter Five, for instance, it's how old is Street Fighter Five now? I should again these topics come up so we don't have time to look it up, but. Uh, Street Fighter V was released in 2016, so it's been out for two yeah. years now. And typically in the past, I mean, with Street Fighter IV, they had, I think, three or four different editions of that game. With five, instead, they are going for these patches. Like, each season, they will change and tweak these characters. <laughs> yes, it is ultimate. Yeah. And we'll ne we may never see another... <laughs> <laughs> yes. We may never see another Smash game, because I think the developer may uh, commit himself when this is all over after those guys are working on it. But yeah. we are definitely seeing uh, fighting games, at least in the more recent era, trying to be more like uh, CCGs or even uh, MOBAs, where right. we're keeping to one game, but we are going to make those tweaks and changes over how many months or a year the season is. Yeah, and and that's that's really, I think partly that's a, a market shift, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The idea of kind of games as ser games as services or these service games mm -hmm. where um, your goal is to capture player attention mm -hmm. uh, for sustained periods of time. Uh, so it's not just about them, you know. It's it's the broader you know microtransactions, subscription games, etc., where you want your players to come back again and again and again and keep buying things. And that's that's part of an overall market shift. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how, more, as we get more of these games, how games that have, you know, player avatars uh, deal with this as they get late into their cycle. And it's possible some of them just die, right? That's, that's possible. Uh, and likely some of them already have died. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, there will be a point where, you know, uh, uh, Drakken mentions, you know, there are, there are essentially champions who are dead now um, in League of Legends. There will be a point where, you know, the number of kind of dead, con the amount of dead content in your game that's just not viable competitively mm -hmm. will reach a critical mass. And that's a business decision for you as a company to decide what you want to do with that and how you want to um, leverage that. Do you want to leverage that? 
will it make players feel bad if it just sits there and you're like, oh man, like can't mm-hmm. can't use this. I will really would have liked to, but I can't. Um, because the solution is not we are going to have 500 characters and they're all going to be balanced and viable and competitive. <laughs> That's no. just it's just not possible. Yeah. Um. So, but there are other things that you can do to to make that interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but as you said, John, we have seen many multiplayer-based games die out because of that, where it gets to that point of, yes, there are 50 or 100 different choices, but only five of them actually really matter. And if you don't have those five, get the hell out. You're not going to do anything. And it's very hard. I mean, it, we've been talking about competitive-based games. I mean, again, this is another topic that there's way too much to go into just in a single section. But... We see this in so many different titles where it gets to that point of, as we said, when the meta becomes stabilized like that, that you really, it really starts to um, shrink your consumer base. Because most consumers, they're not going to get those higher tier characters or get that stuff right at the get go. So it gets to that point of, as a lot of people describe with League of Legends, you know, LO hell of people just doing all crazy stuff, but really high end play is about doing it like this. And everything else really doesn't matter. And that's a good way for consumers to just get tired of your game. Where why should I play your game the way that I want to play it when everybody else is just doing it like this because that's the best way? Yeah. Um, and and I think it's, it's going to be a big challenge now that more companies are moving to a, a game model. You know, we talked about what what I've been calling lifestyle games. There are a couple other other terms for them, but ga- the goal of your business model is to have your game be the primary game that they play to the exclusion of other games. Mm-hmm. Um, which, uh, you know, if that's your business model, you need to figure out how to keep your core fan base engaged over time. But, you know, we talk about uh, churn. So churn is how many new players are signing up versus how many current players are leaving. Uh, so a, a high, you know, you might have a stable subscriber rate, right? You're all, you always mm-hmm. have 30 million players a month. But if your churn is really high, that can be a problem for you because what you really want to be is you're going to grow at some point to a size where, you know, the maximum number of people who are in your market have either are playing or have already tried your game and your cost to acquire new customers out of that market, right? uh, Is going to go up and up and up in terms of advertising or incentives or deals to make new players to get them to sign up. And so it's, it turns some of the, the value of the game. You're investing more and more of your, your money into marketing the game, and so uh, you, uh, I think MMOs are a great example of this, where very mature MMOs end up having to spend quite a bit of time and energy figuring out how to get new players to sign up because it's just so difficult uh, to get new players to come into yep. an MMO uh, and try to you know level up their characters from scratch while there's all these high high level players running around. Um, and so you have to shift, you know, not just uh, game balance and, and gameplay, but almost your kind of whole strategy about who your product is for and how you market to them and who you are as a customer, as, as a company and the way you manage your customer relations. And people have had a lot of trouble with that. Yeah. And like, as you said, John, there will come that point for any game that everybody who would ever have a reason to try your game has already done it, and if those and if you're not keeping people invested in your game, it doesn't matter. And I guess this is its own little tangent itself, but this is why I'm always very skeptical when I see like free-to-play mobile games release like a one-month result saying we had three million people sign up for this month. Okay, but how many of those people stood or stayed for the next month? Because as we've said, with the idea behind lifestyle games or games as a service, it's not about how well you do one month. It's about keeping those numbers stable and ideally growing for months and even years in a lot of cases. 
Yeah, and this is why, actually, when I talk to game designers in the tabletop space, a lot of people, uh, had one, the, one of their early projects is they played existing TCGs or CCGs or digital CCGs, and they're like, ah, I'm going to make a TCG. And you, the, the reality mm-hmm. is you just can't. Um, your ability to create a new lifestyle game as an independent <laughs> designer and developer is it's so minimal. The, the money required for these games isn't mm-hmm. just your art and your development cost and paying people to make the game. Uh, having a successful lifestyle game requires a tremendous marketing budget. Oh, yes. Uh, and so if you look at uh, the, CC, the paper CCG market, um, when you see, you know, the the late '90s and early 2000s are just littered with TCGs that got canned mm-hmm. uh, because what happened was, you know, Magic's blowing up, Pokemon's blowing <laughs> up, Yu-Gi-Oh's blowing up, and everyone's like, ah, I have an intellectual property. I'm going to make a TCG about it. And there's just only so much attention that you can capture in that market. And if you just think that having, and th- and this is sad, if you think that having a good playable game is enough to be successful as a lifestyle game you're gonna fail because that's not really what it's about you're competing for mind share with all these other people um yeah uh (laughs) and and so that's and i think it's gonna be a problem for indie developers you know, when we talk about games that are not lifestyle games, um, if a majority <laughs> of the player base is shifting to play lifestyle games, uh, you know, as we see, you know, more and more entrants of lifestyle games that are more mm-hmm. casual, right? So we, uh, and by the way, I think this is a good thing. But if you look at something like Fortnite, yep. Fortnite's barrier to entry as a lifestyle style game is much lower than the barrier to entry of League of Legends as a lifestyle game. Uh, And so the fact that we're going to have lifestyle games that capture the casual or that what we the mid-core market Mm -hmm. means that mid-core indie developers are going to get squeezed out of a little more time because where previously those players may have played Mm -hmm. you know, six to 20 different games a year now maybe they're going to play one lifestyle game plus you know four other non-lifestyle games in that yep. year, um, or you know depends on how hardcore your your market is, right? And so as the market gets more professionalized, unfortunately, it means that marketing your game is going to become a much bigger factor in your game success and. We're already kind of seeing this in the board game space, which is, you know, a few years behind the video game space in terms of uh, the big growth curve, where, you know, a couple years ago on Kickstarter, if you just had like a functional game that was at all good, uh, you could get it, uh, you could be successful on Kickstarter. And now, you know, the, the average production value and the amount of marketing and the amount of work it takes to fund your print run through Kickstarter is going up and up and up. Uh, and it'll continue to squeeze uh, people out, I think, over the next five years. Uh, some some people believe there there is a Kickstarter bubble happening right now on for board games. Uh, I don't think it's a bubble. I think we're just gonna see a contraction uh, where the overall market is going to continue to grow, the amount of money being made, the revenue, the sales are going to keep going up, but the percentage of that money that's being made by the biggest publishers is going to grow, and the smaller publishers are unfortunately going to get squeezed out. Mm-hmm. And uh, I want to s- uh, stay on Fortnite for a second. Again, this is another hour discussion we wanted to be, yeah. but. <laughs> Like, and this is the big issue, I think, for a lot of people with Fortnite. Because as you said, John, when we start talking about these lifestyle games, it's not just about the gameplay. It's about the branding. It's about that investment. And one of the things that I think a lot of people, especially developers, tend to not understand is that once someone becomes invested with Game X, 
they are not going to switch to game Y. <laughs> exactly. It, no matter how great your game is. If I'm, you know, for the people who are hooked on Fortnite, why the hell should they try PUBG? Why the hell should they go to H1Z1 or any other game, even if a brand new, um, I completely forgot to turn for a second, Battle Royale game is better? It could be mechanically more involved than Fortnite. Yeah. But and Fortnite that's... is entrenched, so why should you switch to it? Yeah, and that's something that you know we were talking about when I talked to new newer designers or developers mm -hmm. <laughs> who are uh, who are working. You know, they they played a TCG and they're like, ah, there's so many problems in this game that we played. Right? We talked. No game is perfect. Mm -hmm. If I could make a new game that's like this really successful game and it mm -hmm. fixes these problems that I know, I know mm -hmm. huge percentages of the fan base of that game don't like this thing. Mm -hmm. Right, and my game is strictly better, uh, but it doesn't matter because the switching <coughs> cost is so yeah. high, and the you know the the uh, the board yeah. game space is just littered with games that are Yu-Gi-Oh but slightly better, <laughs> or games that are Magic but slightly better. And we're um, seeing a f we're going to be seeing it's just like Fortnite, it's just like PUBG. That's going to be our description right. for like the next probably mm -hmm. six to eight months. I know I've been getting uh, press. Uh, less about that. It's just like Fortnite. You won't play another Battle Royale game. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, Thunderworks Games is in the, in the chat. They are the publishers of Roleplayer uh, mm -hmm. and, a, and a client of mine as a developer. And so, you know, we were talking about kind of uh, sequels and adding on to an established brand. The game that I have mm -hmm. on Kickstarter right now is Lockup, which is a uh, set in the same universe sequel to a very mm -hmm. successful game that they've published called Role Player. Uh, Role Player is a game about making characters in a uh, you know a fantasy role playing game. So it's just about making your character to go on the adventure. It's a game only about the character creation process, and it really appeals to people who are fans of role playing games and like that kind of traditional fantasy uh, setting. It's like a little it's a little bit of a satire. It's got a little comedic edge to it. You know, your character can get traits like being obnoxious, uh, et cetera. <laughs> and so that game is has done really well. Uh, it's ranked, I think, 250 on Board Game Geek right now, like uh, in for the overall all games ever ranking. Uh, so Lockup is the first game that 241. All right, we broke broke the 250 marker. Congrats. So Lockup is the first game uh, that Thunderworks has made uh, set in that same universe. Uh, but it's it's very mechanically different, and so I think <laughs> we're gonna see some of these service games. Uh, you know, when we look, and certainly it's already happened a couple times, where people start making they built a brand for themselves, but in, because your service game is continuing to make money, right? League of Legends mm -hmm. is gonna continue to make money. They're not gonna make a new MOBA. They're gonna make a game that uses all of the branding of League of Legends and put it into a new format, right? This is a puzzle game. This is a <laughs> fighting game. This is an action adventure game. Yeah. Um, and and that's where I think the these service games are gonna try to grow their brands. Yeah, um, um, and as a really strong example of that one, we can certainly look at Blizzard. Blizzard yes. is oh, yeah, definitely the king when it comes to this multi-brand management. Uh, as we obviously know, World of Warcraft has kind of given birth to Hearthstone. And then right. all their brands have kind of coalesced into Heroes of the Storm. And it's not just that. It, and I've said this before about Blizzard, about how great they are at this. It's about these cross-promotional plays. So it's not just about like people who are lifestyle when it comes to Blizzard... It's not just about playing Hearthstone Overwatch. It's about playing all of Blizzard's games because you have that cross-promotional support. I mean, I saw this when I was like getting stuff from like um, Diablo 3. Like, buy Diablo 3's expansion, you'll get a bonus deck in Hearthstone. If you play Hearthstone, right. you get a bonus alpha in Overwatch. You play Overwatch, you can get bonus champions and Heroes of the Storm. <laughs> and it just keeps going and going. Yeah, and if you are an indie developer, you can cross-promote your titles with little things like that, even 
you know, even when you don't have as big of a following as, you know, a Blizzard, right? So uh, for for lockup, right? If you if you get this game, you also get uh, a I think it's a six card promo pack to use in role player, which is the the big first game in this series, uh, and. Part of that was you can actually get all those promos separately. You can buy them on their own. But the way you buy them is you go to the Kickstarter campaign page, which I think is is linked. Uh, it should be linked at the, the top right up here. should be linked somewhere yeah. um, on here. Uh, but part of that is, you know, we're not trying to, you know, uh, anger the fan base, right? It's It's not about... You know, oh, the only way to get this exclusive content is to buy this new game, which it, which certainly some some other games have have done, especially because this is gameplay content for a you know competitive oh, yes. game, right? Um, you know, the, this is not cosmetic content; they they affect gameplay. Uh, but to buy this content, you have to go and put your eyeballs physically on the page where you buy this new product, um, and so it's value for converting some of your existing audience into new audience and you know ideally I think we hope that uh, you know we hope that people who like role player will see lock up and be like ah I like this first game we're gonna buy another game in that same universe um, but the value of, of using the existing brand is only there if we can get them to a learn about and know that this new game is coming out you know that uh, we have this thing and b that the gameplay and the the look and the feel and the experience of the product is appealing to your existing market so you have to know who your customers are and what they want in order to make i think a successful spin-off and a sequel mm -hmm. um, and so that's part of the challenge so you can't just take anything and brand it to your IP. You really, you really have to take a lot of care and and put a lot of work mm -hmm. into making sure that there is appeal to the same core market. Yeah, and again, that is another topic. That's an hour long discussion. And <laughs> oh yeah, as a quick time check, we are just under an hour and fifteen into the stream. It feels like we just started here. I know, but um, I figure. Again, there's still so much more we can talk about. We didn't talk about single player balance all that much, but I'm actually going to touch on it quickly if we yeah. wanted to, but but I think we'll hold on that because I'm actually doing a podcast with uh, Brian Cronin, I hopefully in a few weeks about that very topic. So, we'll I'll save all my thoughts on that for that one because we certainly have more than enough to talk about here. But yeah. um Again, when it comes to balance, we could probably say we could probably just spend the next two to three hours on that very topic alone. But we did set a soft stop point, at probably like around an hour and a half, which most likely we are going to be hitting very easily. <laughs> like uh, John was just saying this before we started, he's like, "Yeah, we said last one was going to be like a thirty-minute cast, and we went like almost like two hours." So. I think with that, let's move on to like kind of like our final set of topics, and that's kind of like what you've been working on, and this will be where we'll wrap it up. And again, John, I, since you're a freelance, it means you also have a lot of free time, so if you want to come back on again in the future, definitely let me know. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like one of the things that I really like about when we talk is mm -hmm. we, we drift from, you know, sometimes we'll be talking about something that's very specific to you know, a single implementation, you know, what are, what are some strategies when you're developing a game that has snowballing? But then we also get to talk about some really fun, high-level concepts that are happening in the gaming industry as a whole. How is how is the whole industry shifting to react to new trends? Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's part of what I, what I really like about when we get to catch up, so. Yeah, I mean, we only had like, I think like two or three people in the chat today, but it really doesn't matter. Cause, I mean, this conversation has been fascinating. And I'm yeah. sure people will be watching this recorded when it goes up in a few weeks. But again, I always say this, we could just sit here and chat <laughs> for like the whole Saturday, but to begin to wrap things up, and I guess... Uh, for anyone who is watching us live right now, if you do have any questions for John, this will kind of be last call. Because once we're done talking about what his projects are, that will be our stop point for this afternoon. But um, let's start, I guess, with what we've been kind of talking about, and that is lock up. Let me 
Let's see, I lock should... up a lock up a role player tail, and I am uh, just going to drop a, another link to that in the chat. And if it doesn't show up, let me know, and I will include it on my end because YouTube um, seems to be very weird about. Oh, oh, you can't. Oh, you can't put links in the chat. That's right. Um, okay. Well, we we can we can maybe put it up. Uh, in the in the video description, I think I sent it to you. Yeah, but uh, and I'll include uh, a second link to it right now. Hopefully, it will actually go because YouTube actually blocked me too. So I think they're getting very strict in terms of what links I'll have. But let me see um, if I can put this up really fast. Anyway, so lock up role player tail uh, looks like this. This is the box cover uh, is a game as we talked about set up set in the role player universe uh and in lockup you are crews of fantasy monsters that have been locked in Colback prison and you're kind of committing petty gr crimes you're stealing resources you're you know crafting items to improve your reputation as a crew uh so it's been a really really fascinating project because not only am i thinking as a developer about how to tweak this game. I did a lot of work on, on balancing and kind of final little mechanical tweaks before the game went to market. Uh, but also I'm looking at how to make this game appeal to fans of role player. Uh, what types of players are they? What elements of the theme are they gonna care about? Uh, because I think there is something really fun in this kind of fantasy satire universe of, of being the bad guys, right? We, we had this game where we were the heroes, and now we are uh, actually, so there was role player, then there was an expansion, role player minions and monsters was the, the first expansion for, the, uh, for role player. And so lockup, we are actually many of the minions from minions and monsters now as the protagonists of a new game. Uh, so one of the things we, we just announced uh, on the Kickstarter was a stretch goal for being overfunded. We are, we are already funded on Kickstarter uh, that we call the Traits Mini Expansion. And this is just one more way to connect the game of Lockup back to its predecessor in role player. So in role player, you know, we talked about you're developing your character and you're giving them personality and you can get these traits. Like you can be an obnoxious halfling bard. Uh, all bards are obnoxious, by the way, for, for everyone watching. Um, and so the traits expansion is actually a way to kind of translate, and I, we'll see if the glare is, is too much on these. Uh, it's a way to kind of translate some of those qualities from role player into lockup. Uh, so they give you variable starting conditions and variable uh, kind of starting resources and powers depending on what trait you select at the beginning of the game. So your crew is gonna be different. You know, if you're the obnoxious goblins, that's gonna be very different than, you know, the focused kobolds. Uh, and helps kind of appeal to players who want a little bit more character and a little bit more uh, kind of thematic. Thematic is not quite the right word, but if you wanna, have some of the same feelings that you get in role player about creating your character and embodying a, a character or, or a race. I think that's that's part of what the the traits expansion adds into lockup. And so that was personally as a developer, this was my favorite thing to work on. Uh, so this was something that I came up with and and pitched to Thunderworks as part of my development contract uh, because it you know my again my view is as a developer I'm not just there to tweak your game to remove the rough edges and help with the balancing. I'm also there to amp up the fun. And so this was something that I thought was going to provide a lot of really cool and interesting choices for people who were already fans of the role player universe in lockup. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I mentioned we were talking about standalone sequels. Lockup is a very different game than role, than role player. Uh, for people who aren't as familiar with categorizations of, of board games, role player, the core kind of mechanism of it is what we call dice drafting. The idea that random die are rolled into the middle, but instead of just looking at what comes out and that's your result, you're actually drafting them out of a pool. Uh, so it's a, it's a game with die, but with relatively low randomness. 
Uh, Lockup is in a genre in board games we call a worker placement game. The idea is that you have your crew of fantasy monsters, and you're going to send them out to different locations within the within the prison to do different tasks for you. Uh, and those two genres are very mechanically different. So the key was, can we capture some of the same feelings and some of the same tensions, right? Is the emotional experience going to appeal to the same types of players? Uh, the idea of building, of, of progressing, uh, the idea that I embody some fantasy trait or fantasy trope uh, that's going to kind of trigger some nostalgia in me for you know, my experiences playing Dungeons and Dragons or RPG video games or some sort of, you know, fantasy game universe. And that's, I think, where a lot of attention has to be played in, in playtesting to how players, not only what types of actions are they taking, is the game balanced, you know, but also how are players feeling at different parts of the game experience? And are we delivering the experience and the emotional payoff that players are expecting when they come into the game. And, and that's something that I think is, is really important and really, really hard to nail as a developer and uh, something that I personally have to pay a lot of attention to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as we were talking about before the cast, it's very hard sometimes to know just whether your fan base will move to another game or to another kind of genre within that same universe. And there's a greater discussion here, again, another who knows how many hours, about <laughs> when we see developers kind of make those pivots and whether or not they can keep those, the fans going or if they're going to lose them and then hopefully try to recoup that again with that churn for whatever their next project is. Right. And, you know, and so you can look at something like, uh, like let's, let's take um, WoW and Hearthstone and then lock up and role player as examples, right? Hearthstone is a totally different game than mm -hmm. WoW. The types of things that you do in this game are so different. Um, you know, other than some loose theming and the fact that you have classes that are, are similar. Mm -hmm. and, and similarly, lock up is a completely different game genre than, than role player. So part of the appeal of a game like Hearthstone or Lockup is that the new genre that your game is in is already a, a popular, thriving genre with, with uh, players who are fans, right? So Lockup is a, you know, a, a CCG, TCG. And so part of it is you're marketing, you have your fans of WoW, and you want to bring them into new game in the WoW universe. And then part of it is you have TCG and CCG players who maybe don't even play WoW, Mm -hmm. uh, and you're saying, check out this new TCG, CCG thing. Also, it has the theme from this successful product, and the fact that they've heard of your other product and know it's a success may be a plus for them. Mm -hmm. And so for Lockup, we were looking at similar things, right? Part of it is, here's a game that we think role player fans are going to love, and part of it is, here's a worker placement game, and we know that there are people who love worker placement games who are gonna who are gonna really dig this new twist on worker placement. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I guess a quick question for you, John. Uh, as you said, uh, when it comes to lock lock up, it's being published. I think you said by uh, Thunder. What was the name of the company? Again? Uh, Th Thunderworks Games is Thunderworks the publisher. Thunderworks Games. When you were brought in, like in terms of this is one of your is this one of your freelance jobs that you work yeah this on? is this is a freelance development. So I'm actually not the designer of Lockup. Okay. Uh, the designer is Stanislav Kordonsky, uh, and so the publish he licenses his game to the publisher, and then the publisher Thunderworks hires me to to help work on the prototype. All right. I guess um, in terms of like the work you did again, you don't need to talk specifics. So how long have you worked with Thunderworks on Locked Up? So uh, Lock Up is actually a very interesting project for me. Uh, the game was very close to being ready for market, and I came in pretty late in the process. So I've actually only been on the Lock Up project uh, since uh, beginning of August. Uh, so very quick turnaround, in, you know, because the game is already up on, on Kickstarter. Uh, that said, you know, behind the scenes, I was working a lot, a lot of hours to, to get this ready kind of, kind of 
rush is rush is not the the right word like i you know i did probably as much play testing as i would do on a normal you know 10 or 12 week projects in about you know 6 weeks so uh it's been it's been interesting uh coming in so close to the end there are things that you know I had to really kind of focus my time and, and narrow down here are the core aspects that I'm going to be able to make the most impact on and and where am I going to focus. And I think we were, re I was actually uh, pleasantly surprised uh, how much really quality work and improvements we got in such a short time. Because, hmm. uh, you know, at the outset, I have no idea where that process is going to go. Am I, you know, how how much am I going to be able to deliver back as, as part of this process? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, ideally, and you know, we were talking about kind of the, the structure of being a freelancer, you know, my, my goal is, you know, obviously I want to make each individual game as, as awesome and as, as cool and as fun as I can. Uh, but I also want to show my clients that I, am making their games more fun and so you know we will see i am i'm hoping to work on more games with thunderworks in the future uh because they are working on on obviously you know most publishers release a couple games a year uh and so you know we've already been talking about maybe some some potential projects down the line uh, but so it, it's very interesting when we talk timelines on these projects too because board games you know we were talking about how difficult they are to patch right so I have to really play test a lot to get a really high degree of confidence in the in the material I'm delivering in a, in a fairly short amount of time uh, because ultimately you know when this game comes out we are not going to be able to change things yeah. uh, we might be able to issue some errata put put out a new edition in the rule book but even most of the people who buy the game might never see those changes in that errata so we got to make sure that we are super super confident in the quality of the, of the game and of the experience we're delivering mm -hmm. and I guess as a quick question for you Tom regarding like coming into these different projects is it better for you to come in like during like the early stay of the game or more towards the late or does it really depend on the project itself uh, it depends on the project I think uh, my ideal job is I come in actually at, I do come in the earlier in the middle stage of the game the better uh, because they're uh, at, at least as a as a developer uh, because the designer is responsible for kind of the core vision and experience of the game and so what I don't want to do is come in too early where I'm now designing the game from from you know scratch or relative scratch I want to make sure that there's a really solid vision and a solid set of, of working mechanics uh, built and tested and that we know who the game is for and who its market is and, it, you know, et cetera, before I get involved. Yeah. Uh, you know, what, because I, you know, I am also a designer. And so, you know, if I wanted to work doing contract design, that's a very different thing. Like, you know, the publisher has a concept for a game and they hire me to design that game for them from scratch. I do that as well, but for projects where I'm coming in and there's already a designer, I prefer to get involved kind of in the, the middle stages, yeah. uh, you know, when we're maybe six, six to eight months out from, uh, you know, going to Kickstarter or hitting print if it's a direct to retail release. So that I have, I have plenty of time to work slowly on individual aspects of the game you know I'm not maybe working 20 to 30 hours a week on uh, on the game at that point you know I'm I'm running small iterations I'm running some play tests I'm letting things percolate you know I'm in kind of slow but constant communication with the with the designer and the developer as we we go through the process I think is what my my ideal project looks like obviously every project as you know every project is different right mm -hmm. so some some games i'm going to be working like lockup i'm working mostly on on balancing uh and final tweaks you know some games i'm working on the basically the development of an entire new game mode or game system uh so i have a project that's coming out uh february of next year uh that i will i can ping a link to 
uh, called Refuge Terror from the Deep. And this is another kind of sequel game. And the original game is a two to six player competitive game. And the sequel is a has a two to six player competitive game in the box <laughs> and a one to four player cooperative game in the box where you play against a solo AI. Uh, and so I'm responsible end to end for taking a competitive game experience and turning it into a cooperative game experience. And so that's gonna be a, a process for me over the next you know four or five months. And that's something a topic. I think that could certainly be its own podcast <laughs> right there, especially. Oh, yeah. I think that's also another interesting topic I want to talk about at some point about when we see these tabletop games have multiple versions within the same box. You know, you have the competitive aspect and you also have co-op at the same time. And kind of the challenges that go into both about design game around those two different sets. Yeah, um, and and that's that's its own. That is definitely its own topic about uh, yeah. variant games. You know, game modes. Uh, when we, you know, and I think that's true for digital too. When you talk about, you know, I'm going to develop a single player game and a multiplayer game in this, you know, and that's going to be my package. That's you know, keep in mind you're you're signing yourself up to do two very different mm -hmm. types of design and playtesting, and you know, understanding what your what is your core product, and you know, is it a variant or is it a full you know game experience that you're you're providing? Uh, is your your you know your solo game uh, going to be? just a version of your multiplayer game with AI or is it going to be a very different type of experience uh, and you know and certainly in the video game space there are uh, lots of games that take both approaches right some games mm -hmm. uh, your solo game is just totally different uh, you know you have your story game and then you have like the multiplayer deathmatch Oh, God. Uh, that's uh, getting us really close to that top. I'm going to be talking to Brian about when it comes to single and multiplayer because again yeah. it gets very complicated yeah, and but, so that's that's its own it's mm -hmm. that's its own challenge, not just from a development perspective, but on you know how how do you want to position your time and your efforts and your energy and you know do these two games that you're putting in the same box even appeal to the same people? Uh, you know that's that you're that is a an hour and a half just on its own, I think. Yeah. But I know we are just about out of time for today. So to begin to wrap things up then for you, John, are there any other topics, or I'm sorry, any other uh, games you're working on or projects that you'd like to plug right now? Um, you know, if you're interested in uh, in checking out Lockup, uh, we'll make sure the uh, Kickstarter link is in the video description mm -hmm. for this video. Uh, the game that I was just talking about, Refuge Terror from the Deep, is really really cool uh, and that's going to be coming uh, February of next year and so we'll put a link there's a Facebook group uh, that we kind of are coordinating getting feedback we're sending out like free prototypes like doing art teasers all that kind of stuff so we'll have a, we'll have a link to that uh, down in the description of the video if any of you are interested in like cool steampunk <laughs> underwater adventures uh, the art is already looking super amazing, and we're gonna have really awesome uh, miniatures of these steampunk divers. So mm -hmm. I'm pretty excited for this one. Yeah, and there's right. a giant kraken, I should say. <laughs> so that always helps. Uh, Dragon just said we're already at the end. Yet yeah, we've been talking for an hour and a half, like it's nothing <laughs> here. And my voice is starting to go. I'm sure, John, is your voice starting to uh, disappear? Yeah, I, uh, I ran out of water. You know, maybe maybe 10, 15 minutes ago. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I had a, a very ni nice big glass to keep myself hydrated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, yeah, again, John, it's always a pleasure having you on. And Devlin, congratulations with the success of Lockup's Kickstarter. And I'm sure we'll be chatting again in the future about some of your upcoming projects, especially about all the different topics we've left on the table here. Yeah, uh, as always, awesome, awesome talking to you, Josh. All right. For anybody watching this either live or recorded, if you are working on your upcoming game or just like talking about game design, we are always looking for new guests to come on, so please don't hesitate to get in touch. And if you're watching this recording with like an ad-free version of this cast, be sure to check out my Patreon, patreon.com slash GWBicer. I guess a uh, last thing for you, John, uh, regarding social media, is there anything you would like to plug right now before we let you go? 
Yeah, if you're you're interested in kind of following along with my projects or uh, getting in touch with me, uh, the best place to do that is Twitter. It's uh, at Das Brieger, D-A-S-B-R-I-E-G-E-R, and there'll be a, a link to that in the video description mm -hmm. as well. Feel free, you know, shoot me a, a tweet, send me some questions. Uh, you know, I use that pretty much only to talk about board games and board game development, and uh, I'm pretty active on there, so. Mm-hmm. All right, well, I think with that, we will say good night. You might hang on Skype for like one more minute once we end, we sign off. But uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Be sure to check out Lock Up as well as John's other titles. Again, we'll include uh, links to the various social media in the description down below. But uh, check back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where we stand the art and science of games. So have a great Saturday afternoon for those of you watching this live. I'll see you guys later tonight. But until our next stream, have a good weekend, everybody.